Okay. Let's start off with uh, with some some Hobbes, some Thomas Hobbes from 1651. Not, you know, bringing in some old guy here. 1651, Thomas Hobbes was writing, uh, you know, people used to write in Latin, write in Latin, wrote of the bellum omnium contra omnes, which is often described as the war of all against all, or the war of everyone against everyone, as it's translated here. Uh, Hobbes's idea was that people, he probably would have said man, man in a state of nature is naturally violent. But the, well, he also was the person who coined the phrase that life in a state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short. So the idea was that, you know, those, those hunter gatherers that we would now politely call them and what they probably would have called savage man uh, back in the day or, uh, you know, the, the man of the, the man, I don't even know. They don't th even think they thought about jungles back then. This is still 1651. Anyway, the idea is that the, 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 the natural instincts of people were to be violent and to be fighting each other at all times. And that the only way to control people, the only way to sort of make them give up this war of everybody against everybody was to bring in the state, and this is actually from a book of his called, or essays, uh, The Leviathan, which is this idea that there is going to be a, a larger authority that is going to dampen down the, our, our natural tendencies to be the war of all against all. Now, Hobbes was not the only, you know, I mean, there were, there were people who were who were thinking about different things than Hobbes was. And Hobbes obviously, he wasn't an anthropologist at all. He was sort of making an abstraction or sort of extrapolating or imagining what people were, would, what man would be like in this state. Um, he was famously, uh, or I would say that, that there was always a, what you would call the counter tendency, which was Rousseau, which was, you know, the idea, which is uh, oversimplifying here, but, you know, the idea of the, the, uh, the, 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 um, the noble savage, right? The idea that the people in a state of nature are actually naturally good and that it is actually the state or modern society which makes people bad or makes people evil. And so this is what I, what I start this out here with is to show you how deep this argument goes in our own society, because it's a very, it's a it's a very deeply held kind of long-standing, four hundred-year-old argument about this: what people are like to each other, and to what extent we need a something above us, either that be kind of a a sort of a a, a religious god or a state or something to make sure we're. We're, we're behaving and that we don't fall back into this war of all against all or the war of everyone against everyone. Now, this is like, you know, 300 years now, 200 years, 250 years before any sort of anthropology would come out, any sort of uh, idea of people actually going out into look at these people that you would consider in a state of nature or the savage man. This was, like I said, even Rousseau or, or Hobbes, it was basically based on speculation, sort of sitting in their, their office chairs. They had offices, their pleasant leather chairs and speculating about this state of nature. So it would be, you know, another 250, 300 years before anybody would actually try and figure this one out. And I guess for a long time, anthropology would say, no man, Hobbes, that doesn't work. And so, you know, we would, instead of the Hobbesian view of human nature, it's not that we would necessarily go with Rousseau, we're not into noble savages either, but we would say that, uh, as Margaret Mead put it, in this extremely famous, well, at least in anthropology, but, it's, you know, a very sort of, remember, if you remember, uh, Margaret Mead was very famous in the outside world too, uh, you know, her article 
warfare is only an invention, not a biological necessity, written in 1940, which is, you know, the sort of height of World War II. So it was, you know, a, a pretty influential uh, essay in the sense that people were thinking, well, maybe, maybe people are naturally prone to warfare. And she said, no, that is, that is a social invention. Um, and that in some ways, what anthropology's argument has been is that people aren't naturally violent, nor are they naturally peaceful. They're shaped both by, by, by their biology and culture. After Margaret Mead, we would also get the bonobos, of course. And, you know, I mean, for those of you who've been forced to watch what bonobos do when they have nothing else to do. Um, yeah, I know, it's terrible, isn't it? They really don't do that as much when they are out, you know, just doing their bonobo thing in the wild. The problem is there aren't that many bonobos in the wild. And when you put them into captivity, then they start doing more of what we make you watch, you know, to make sure that make sure that you know about the sexual repertoire of the bonobos and that humans are hardly unique in having some strange things that we do to each other. Um, so this is, you know, but these were more recent discoveries. Uh, the bonobos, you know, weren't even around, not that they weren't around, they weren't even observed. They were not, they weren't even observed. We only had the chimpanzees for a long time and chimpanzees, when they get bored, they seem to do other things to each other, uh, which are not as nice. So, but you know, we have, we had this kind of idea that, well, you know, even in our sort of, uh, these two species, which are equidistantly related to us biologically, you can see very different behaviors in terms of their, uh, in terms of what they do when they get agitated, let's put it that way. So for a long time, this kind of held up, or this would be anthropology's answer. Uh, and the other thing that we did was we would say, well, actually, Hobbes, it turns out that um, people can organize themselves in a very sophisticated way outside of having to have a state or a government. And so we would talk about, we would say, well, no, life in a state of nature, it's actually not even in a state of nature because it's hunting and gathering and hunting and gathering takes place in different environments around the world. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's a, uh, um, it's something that, that is, is cultural in nature. And that when we look at the bands of the, you know, what we would call band level organization, that they have kinship ties and marriage ties. And that these ties are, are ways in which people limit their, uh, their aggressiveness uh, or they, and, and that in fact, you know, that these would be some of the most egalitarian and organized and in some ways nonviolent societies, uh, in part because there was no need, there's no need for warfare. If somebody's going to come into your territory, you just kind of move along. Um, so you know, in, in this in this idea, there isn't there isn't really in the archaeological record when people were organized as bands or hunters and gatherers, uh, the any sort of record of large scale violence. So we'd say, hey, look, we can do bands. And we can do tribes, which you know I for, I always forget exactly what what a tribe is. I'll tell you why I forget that in a second. But you know it's the idea that under let's say a horticultural society, so you know small scale gathering or maybe a, maybe some herding, that you'd have a different form of political organization where you would have somebody who's more important, usually an informal form of leadership. And you know that that would be a different form of organization, and then you'd also have chiefdoms, which might be uh, more intensive agriculture, or maybe uh, more intensive uh, uh, of uh, words pastoralism, more intensive like you know herding of animals, and so you'd have more organization. You'd have maybe a um, a system of redistribution where people would sort of have tribute or taxes that would flow up to the chief and then flow back down in a sort of redistributive mechanism. And so, you know, a lot of anthropologists got really interested in this kind of different ways in which people organize themselves outside of the state. And, um, you know, people were, this, this seemed to be a cool thing. Now, 
I do want to emphasize here this little passage that is, for me, is, is more, uh, more uh, instructive. The idea, well, in this, I guess, in the last version, uh, Guest called it putting typologies in perspective, and now he just calls it the problem with typology. So I better update that. I thought he was just putting it in perspective. So the problem with typologies, there's basically three problems, or there's a, there's a lot of problems. But the problems are is that, you know, people have always, as we've seen, been interconnected, they migrate, they trade, they interact with each other, people switch up their groups. And the more you try to define, okay, well, a band is, you know, 50 or less members and it has to be here and it has to be there, the more you, you start to try and pigeonhole people like that, the more they keep crawling out of the categories of the typologies that we've assigned. So it doesn't actually help us to get more and more precise about our definitions because society is, is always sort of changing and, and in flux anyway. So, you know, this can be, this can be a huge issue. It's all, it always is an issue for social scientists. You know, if you make these categories too rigid, then people are always going to be uh, doing something that you, that, that are, like I said, they're, they're busting out of their categories because these are in some ways, I don't want to say every typology is a stereotype, but in some ways it's related to sort of a generalization that we would make about society in that way. The other thing I would say is that the word tribe is, and, and that's why I say, I, never, I always forget exactly what we mean by tribe because everybody uses the word tribe. It's like, oh, you're anthropologists, you're the ones, you must be studying tribes. So tribes has is, is become this word in popular culture, right? So tribes, this is, you know, if you say bands, band organization, people are probably not going to kind of have a stereotype about that. I don't know what they'll think. They'll, I don't know, they might think that you're talking about musical groups. I'm not sure what they think, but they wouldn't have necessarily, no images would pop up into their mind. Certainly if you say the word chiefdom, then you have this idea of a chief. Although I would say that if you say the word tribe, most people are gonna think that it's basically a chiefdom or you have this very high ranking chief leader. You know, you think, oh, he's a chief of the tribe, right? So, uh, you know, these, these words were always kind of problematically used in the popular sphere to the point that, you know, as Guest says, people started to say, well, you know, all tribes anyway are related to the nation state. And so maybe we should stop talking about tribes and start talking more about ethnic groups because, you know, that seems to be more accurate in terms of the, the designation. So this whole, the word tribe is, is tricky in that way. But I think most importantly, and especially when we think back to the, the stuff that we did, when was it? Two weeks ago when we were talking about, uh, or was it only a week ago? the global economy and globalization and the ways in which way before anthropologists ever went out there and did their thing. Even at the time of Thomas Hobbes and Rousseau when they were having their, their debates, that the, the actual people involved were becoming, were, were sort of recruited into colonialism. Now that's not to say that they were always directly affected by colonialism, but even something like, let's say the slave trade, for example, you may not be yourself directly affected by it, but whole peoples would be displaced, uh, pushed around, different kinds of things would happen uh, because of these sort of mass movements and the, the changes brought about under this new organization of transoceanic colonialism. So anthropologists uh, were always very interested in so I guess we developed two, two ideas, right? One is questioning the idea of Hobbes that, you know, this, that people were naturally violent. And we also developed the idea that, well, you know, people can organize themselves, they can govern themselves outside of a state. But we got very more, much more, uh, at least within anthropology, this debate became very internal and very much more sophisticated to the sense that we kind of lost, we, we lost our, our sense of what was going on in the outside world. Now, I, I bring that up because in the last, I would say 10 years, maybe 15 years, last 20 years, uh, there, there have been a number of books 
that have basically resurrected the Hobbesian perspective. In fact, Steven Pinker, who is a, a linguist at, at MIT um, and written a number of famous books, but this is, mm, is this right now his most famous? Uh, the Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. And Pinker kind of has actually explicitly said that he's a Hobbesian, and that he believes that, you know, he's not saying necessarily that people are naturally violent. He does kind of, kind of waffle on that a bit, but his idea is that as people become more and more under the rule of the state, under the rule of government, violence declines, warfare declines. And so, you know, he's always trotting out these figures. He was buttressed by uh, Jared Diamond's uh, book that came out shortly after that called The World Until Yesterday, What Can We Learn from Traditional Societies, which was a bit more sympathetic towards what we might call traditional societies, but nevertheless borrowed this idea that in those societies that we might consider bands, tribes, chiefdoms, that they were more violent than in, uh, than in our society. And so we would learn something, but we wouldn't learn about that. And then finally, it was, uh, whoops, uh, the book uh, that came out, ah, ah. <laughs> what do I wanna do? I wanna move myself out of the way. A book called Noble Savages, there it is, by Napoleon Shagnon, who was a very controversial anthropologist all the time. And what, you know, he, you can see the subtitle, My Life Among Two Dangerous Tribes, the Yanomamo, who were uh, often the, uh, he was one of the people who said he'd kind of not necessarily discovered them, but was their most famous ethnographer in the 1950s uh, and 60s in, in the Brazilian uh, Amazon and uh, that area around Brazil and, and Venezuela. I live among two dangerous tribes, the Yanomamo and the anthropologists, because he got very heavily criticized by anthropologists because he was in some ways uh, supporting this idea of, you know, that people in their, their natural state, he was actually trying to in some ways uh, quantify the idea that, that people who went off and did violent raids would then reproduce more. Um, I will not go into, the, into the, the specifics of that. It's been a long debate in anthropology, uh, not always the nicest debate. Um, why I bring these up? What happened out there in the world is that Pinker, Diamond, and Shagnon basically took these typologies and they said, aha, here's a society that's a band, or here's a society that's a tribe. And then let's count up. Let's count up the number of people that get killed in it. And then we'll sort of divide by the population. And thus violence has gone down without ever understanding that all of these societies had, had been transformed by colonialism, had come into relationship with the state. And so that when anthropologists were studying them, certainly, you know, when, how to say, the Yanomamo already had steel axes, right? They were not in some sort of natural state. They were already transformed by colonialism. They, you know, a lot of these societies that are cited by these guys had alcohol that, were, that, that was part of their, you know, that was part of the trade networks. So, you know, I mean, for those of you who know about what alcohol and like trading and money and guns do, let's say if you're out, you know, participating in the fur trade and you're being paid in alcohol and firearms, it's probably gonna ratchet up the amount of, you know, violence within your society. So there was a total kind of disregard for the more sophisticated ideas that anthropologists are trying to get. And these guys just sort of counted it all up and said, hey, things are, things are getting more peaceful for us in our state level societies. Which then brings us to an idea that, that, that some of you were, seem to be nicely, I think, very interested in. It's a, it's a really interesting idea to think about. It comes to us from a hundred years ago. And it, I think we've talked about it before in this class. Uh, it's Weber's idea of, you know, well, what, what is the state? And, you know, we can talk about the state in terms of, of things that we usually think the state does. And, the state taxes and the state builds things and the state regulates things and the, the state has political organization. 
but he came up with this idea, which has, has always, I mean, he's kind of like, you know, this is another one of those ideas that people are always kind of thinking about in the back of their minds. Um, when, when we talk about, um, when we talk about uh, uh, states and, and what, what it means to live in a government. So he defines the state as a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force or coercive authority within a given territory. So a lot of the uh, you know, people in bands and tribes and chiefdoms are interesting because there is no one with coercive authority. People might have persuasive authority. They might be able to persuade you to do something, but they don't actually have coercive authority. And so what Weber was arguing was, is that a state in some ways is the one that we grant or, or that we agree is the only one that should have legitimate coercive authority. Now that's not to say that there aren't acts of coercion within a state, but those would be seen as illegitimate. Now, I think that some of you started to think about this because you're like, well, wait a second. That doesn't seem like it describes, you know, the United States of today. And, you know, I think that's a legitimate issue. I mean, Weber is describing sort of European states a hundred years ago, he probably wasn't thinking about American gun culture to go back to an old theme, right? He, you know, I mean, I think that there are probably people today who have never ever thought that the state was the only legitimate use of physical force. And, you know, I mean, I think that that's one, some of the debates that we're having in our society right now is, are there other groups which we should give which we which have any sort of phys, uh, uh, physical force which might be considered legitimate. And this is probably not true only in the United States. There's a whole bunch of countries in which it's kind of assumed that one of the ways that you get to state power is not necessarily by an election, but by forming a forming a, an army and going over and taking over the state. And then once they are in, you reorganize things, and then somebody disagrees with you, they form another army and take over the state that way. So there have been, you know, I mean, this is, this is in some ways one of, uh, Weber was famous for making ideal types, things that were not necessarily uh, realized in practice, but you could say, well, this approximates uh, the ideal type. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about whether it's true. It's a very interesting idea though, to think about, you know, to what degree do we consent to define a certain organization be that the military or the police as having legitimate authority. And certainly others of you brought up in the, in the comments and the discussion comments that, you know, it's also the case that we are starting to question whether, or some people are questioning, wh why do we need, not only why do we need so many people with guns, why do we need to have our police with guns? Why is it whenever we call up somebody to say, you know, I don't know, have a, somebody's parked on my lawn or something, why does somebody with a gun need to show up on my lawn? You know, it's kind of a, it's kind of an issue. Do we need to have that much coercive authority going on just to get a car off my lawn? I'm not sure if that's ever happened. They usually just bring a tow truck, but you know what I'm saying? You call the police, they show up with a gun. You're like, oh, okay, too much for me. Um, anyway. I wanted to go back to something that I think I showed you before. I, and I think it's kind of useful to think about in this context. So right after the, the idea, this is, on, uh, this is on page 347, uh, right after talking about uh, the, the Weberian argument uh, regarding the, the, uh, the legitimate use of force, uh, he brings up, uh, Guest brings up Gramsci, who we know from talking about hegemony or how a state or a government or an elite group or society in general gets people to sort of buy into things or agree with things without necessarily having to coerce them to do things. How does that happen? And I talked about how in some ways, you know, I, I then uh, previously, I think that Bourdieu's ideas are, are very parallel to Gramsci. And Bourdieu, in, in one of his books, came up with this idea that there is, you know, the, the universe of the undiscussed, the, what he called doxa, so stuff that, that everybody just agrees with. It's not up for dispute. 
It's undisputed, it's just assumed. And if you lived in a society in which the state had a monopoly of legitimate coercive force, that would be your doxa, right? You'd just be like, well, nobody needs to have a gun because the state takes care of that for me. So, you know, they, they're the only ones with a legitimate use of coercive force, that would be doxa. It wouldn't be part of the opinion. So in Bourdieu's world, uh, right, he says that, you know, we have these things that are assumed, but there's all these things in society that we have opinions about, that we debate. And there's the orthodox opinion, or what we might call sometimes the conservative side, the ones that are sort of in the dominant. And there's the heterodox, or what we sometimes call the liberal side, right, the, the plus and the minus. And that that is what we talk about or dispute or have discourse about. So, I mean, I think one could legitimately say that in the United States, there is some uh, debate about whether or not it is, a, uh, it is legitimate for the average person, the average citizen to be able to use coercive force when, I don't know, whenever, when something, when they need to. Uh, this is probably not something that gets debated in every society, but it's certainly up for debate in ours, uh, right? It's sort of, hey, you know, what I'm, you know, uh, how to say. Uh, in certain states, you may have heard the stand your ground laws, that you cannot be prosecuted for shooting somebody if they're attacking you. Uh, you know, it's a, just defending myself, standing my ground. You know, I mean, this would be, uh, this, is, this is an opinion which in some places is codified into law. I'm sure there are certain places that would be like, that's totally insane, you know, like I, it wouldn't even be discussed. It wouldn't be up for dispute. There'd be no legislation about that because everybody would be like, what are you, what? What are you talking about? We did this with, uh, with same-sex marriage, right? We looked at how something that was considered to be totally uh, off the table that had nothing to do with like, you know, that there would be it would be part of the undiscussed and then it, you would look at somebody like, what's that? That doesn't compute. Then moves into the realm of opinion. It moves in first as heterodoxy. So then it becomes a debate. And then people make laws and say, oh no, we're going to have the Defense of Marriage Act, which is going to outlaw this thing that you guys are wanting. And then you'd have, uh, I think that we saw that in some ways uh, that idea moved over into what we might call orthodoxy in which everybody said, oh no, wait, 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 we're in favor, everybody's in favor of that. And it actually became kind of, in some ways, uh, at certain dinner, if you, if you were not in favor of that anymore, then you became kind of an outcast. You would become heterodox and because it would become orthodox to support. And then to a certain extent, for a tiny bit of time, maybe like six months in there, around, I don't know, 2014 or so, uh, it maybe became, at least among the youth, doxa. It was like not even up for debate. You wouldn't even talk about it. Why? There'd be no reason to just be assumed that it would be natural. Now, I'm not trying to say anything about any of these things. I'm just trying to show you how these things can come uh, from the, get moved from the undisputed category, what we assume or is undiscussed into the realm of opinion. And, and it's sort of analytically interesting what moves from here to there. Now, I've been actually been interested in sort of fooling around with this, this box and circle a little bit. So the box is gonna be the doxa, right? The assumed, and the circle is gonna be the opinion, the realm of the assumed and the realm of the opinion. So let me show you something. If you lived in a society, so now I've made my doxa very big. The universe of the undiscussed is huge. There's so many things that we just assume and we don't talk about and that's the way it is. And then there's a tiny little universe of opinion, some things that are up for dispute, but it, it's, it's diminished in relationship to the, uh, to the doxa. What would you think of living in a society like this? Or what would you call a society like that? Where everything was doxa and there was very little opinion. How's that sound? Huh? Not good. Why? <laughs> huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, 
Well, okay. I mean, I guess there's, there's sort of the good and the bad notion of this. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like everybody's kind of brainwashed. That is true. And it sounds like they're all like robots or something. I guess the sort of, if you wanted to say that, if you want to put a more positive spin on this, I actually once introduced this in class and somebody said, it's utopia. Because they didn't want to argue about anything. They didn't want to have any arguments. They just want everybody to, you know, get along and just be, you know, sometimes you might say this, this would be like what we might call a traditional society, right? Where everybody is kind of, okay, well, that's the way we've always done it. And that's the way we're going to keep doing it. And every so often somebody's like, well, should we change that? And, eh, maybe, nah, let's go back to, you know? And, and so I don't know. I mean, I think there's, you know, there's, there's sort of good, there's, 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 uh, there's good and bad to that. Let me contrast that with this society. Very little doxa. Some things that are, yeah, everybody agrees on, but for the most part, everything is up for debate. Everything is a matter of contest. You, you know, the, everything is, you know, you don't know what's going on. Everybody's always ready to have an opinion about it. Now, how do you feel? Still not good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, we should just go back to that balance circle, right? Both of these are kind of extremes. I mean, this, this might be, you know, there might be some things that people like about this, but it's hard to think of yourself as a functioning, you know, this is exhausting, right? You, sometimes you just want to sit down and eat a Thanksgiving dinner without having somebody challenge you on what's in the turkey. You know, I mean, it's like that kind of thing. So, you know, I mean, I think that some people like this, but for many people, it might be a bit too much. Now you might think about, you know, what, what, I, what I'm getting at here is, you know, and you might think about, you might draw for yourself, you know, where you think our society is, where you think the United States is in terms of our, our level of doxa of undiscussed and opinion. And, you know, just think about that. I'll show you where, I th where I'm starting to think it is, which is, uh, this, is my, this is my opinion on it. I'm not sure if it's true. <laughs> Whoops, big chat. I don't want a big chat. Go back, chat. This is my opinion about where we are. I'm not sure. Well, maybe this is maybe this is more extreme than where we are. This is probably, you know, this this maybe this is sort of uh, people actually fighting each other. Uh, but you know, I mean, I think that to a certain extent, um, people on sides, people that are arguing right now about certain things don't even seem to be living in the same universe of facts. So that, you know, it, it would be one thing if we could all ag agree on an undisputed universe of facts, but if some people are living in a universe of facts and other people aren't, and you can, you can debate with me to what extent uh, which people are living in the universe of facts and which aren't, it's very difficult to even have this kind of conversation, to have, have a debate because people are living in these sort of radically different worlds. I bring that up in part because, because of, you know, kind of where, what happened in anthropology and sort of what, what happened to us as a discipline that was trying to make people think differently about their own, about what humans were sort of naturally capable of, to make people think differently about what others, how other people organize themselves, to make people understand that perhaps warfare or even uh, sort of uh, elevated levels of violence was not something that was rooted in our natural state. And I think that that was kind of the, if we go back to the idea of American gun culture, like in an, in an ideal way, what you're trying to say is, well, this isn't a natural thing. This isn't a necessity. Uh, let's look around at, at other societies and see how they organize themselves. And let's look back in time and look at how other people in our history organize themselves. And so this was kind of um, anthropology's 
real contribution. And people like Margaret Mead were way out there in terms of not, not were, were very public about trying to understand and trying to influence um, especially American society uh, in terms of how we thought about ourselves and how we, we organized ourselves. And so what I think, and then I'm gonna quote from Mead uh, that, um, that is in Guest, it's the last, it's the last sentence of her, um, of her essay. And what she said is that, you know, the warfare is not a biological necessity. But if we want to change that, she said, we have to do two things. People must recognize the defects of the old invention. And so one of the things that she was trying to point out is like, hey, this isn't, not only is this not a necessity, it's got some real drawbacks that we're fighting each other so much, right? This is the height of World War II. But then she added something, which is what I think anthropology hasn't done, is someone must make a new one. Like it's not enough to point out the defects. And I guess, how to say it? it's, I mean, it's not the response. I, I, I don't think anthropologists necessarily are able that we're not able to invent or make a new one, but we could at least sort of set us down that road, right? So she says, well, it's not enough to point out the defects of the old. We have to sort of invent new ways to, to socialize, to resolve our conflicts, to, to do the things that we want to do. And I say that, I mean, we're sitting here in 2020, which is four years later than 2016. And um, I remember coming into the classroom on Wednesday of November, 2016. I don't know if you remember being there, where would you have been? Maybe in high school, high school. Right, you weren't here. I was teaching cultural anthropology up there in Johnstown. And um, by that time, things were, uh, things were different than they are now. Everybody was looking at Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, but they'd already gone. They'd already, they'd already been called for Trump. Uh, and, uh, and so I woke up and I put on my coat and tie, <laughs> went into class. And uh, there's this one student, he was like, aha, Antrosio, your man won, huh? <laughs> Which was uh, not exactly my perspective on things. I was just trying to, you know, bring some, uh, bring some analysis to the situation. At the time, I, one of the things I, I know, to, I, I, I sort of said is what, you know, kind of like Margaret Mead, the epicenter of anthropology in terms of anthropology 101 and the introduction to anthropology class, the huge mega lecture that used to be like 500 students at a time that you made everybody take, the sort of epicenter of that approach came right out of the University of Michigan, right out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was like at the very center of this thing. My point was, wow, we taught like thousands of students a year thousands since the 1950s. And we taught them, you know, we taught them these Margaret Mead lessons. And here we are in 2016. And look what it did for us, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. We're at a different stage now. We're looking again at Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Hopefully, well, I won't say hopefully, because then you'll know what I think, but they may come out differently this time. But what I don't think has changed is that, uh, or I think that where, where we've still gone wrong is that we thought if we put on our coat and tie and came in and taught class enough, that maybe we could still educate people. And I think that maybe, you know, I, I didn't think that that was a viable prospect back four years ago. I'm skeptical about it now because I think we spent a lot of time teaching people about the defects of whatever they were thinking, the defects, the defects of the candidate, the defects you know, the, the problems of our society, but we didn't spend enough time trying to get toward the new one, right? The getting rid of the defects and inventing a new one or making a new solution. Uh, we spent way lots of time talking about the defects. Now, I mean, 
you know, it's important to talk about defects, but we also need to talk about, well, how are we going to relate to each other? How are we gonna live out this thing? So, Oh, I had one more slide, but you know what? I think I'm gonna stop there because I think that's a better place to stop. I'm gonna get more depressed than that. So I think that we need to focus on, you know, I think that, you know, we've been very good, like I said, with recognizing the defects of, of the old, um, but we need to figure out someone, someone, maybe one of you out there must make a new one, make a new way of relating to each other that we can actually rally around instead of, uh, instead of uh, simply going back to a, to a system that we know is flawed, but that we don't know how to get out of. So uh, that's what I have to say. Comments, suggestions, questions? <laughs>